you are pretty significantly louder than me. Talk louder. I know, right? All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys podcast. I'm Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And you're in my studio. Yeah, it's good to be back. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have a real person in my room with me. It's so exciting to no longer have to worry about the record button, have to worry about anything going on. Just let you handle it. <laughs> you you don't like being your own tech support? I'm not a producer. <laughs> well, we're super excited to be back for episode 15 of the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. And uh, we actually had a couple different scheduled guests uh, call out on us. So we're uh, doing a little free fly by the flight of our seats and see how this goes. I've never, uh, I've never known you and I to be short on uh, dialogue. So I'm not worried. <laughs> our mouths don't have a... Uh, a way to slow down. There's no mute button. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you know, there's not been a whole lot of news in the industry lately with the COVID thing going on. There's not really a whole lot of press releases or anything like that. Um, Nothing special that I can think about. Just more, I guess, trickled news from Speed UTV, but not to overdo that too much. So, um, yeah, not a whole lot going on in the industry. Have you seen anything? Well, I noticed that things are getting rescheduled and it's nice to have a date established. Obviously, we got our fingers crossed that that's going to still go off, but uh, so far so good. You know, we've got uh, we've got some summer events that have been moved to the fall. It's good to see that nobody's canceling and there's some there's some local events up here in the Pacific Northwest that are still going to happen. And, yeah, uh, I just I'm got an email from UTV that. Takeover. They're yep. they're doing verifications, making sure people are showing up. Rally in the Pines seems like that's a go out in Salmon, Idaho. Uh, there is a there's a rally coming up in two weeks in the Northern Cascades. Out by it's pretty close to OMAC. That thing's still a go. So Dune Fest yeah. was canceled. Dune Fest was canceled altogether. Yeah. Do we uh, foresee uh, Sandsport and SEMA and all that stuff going off, or do you think that? Uh, this has changed the game, and we're not going to see those big uh, big events anymore. Well, no, nothing's been released to support that, that, that they're going to cancel it. Uh, it's going to be up to the governor, I'm sure, right. whether or not that gets canceled. Um, an event as big as Sandsport, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if, if it wound up being that type of situation that they might try and move it just for a year. I mean, that could be a possibility, but as far as SEMA goes, SEMA is probably going to happen. You know, they, they might have a situation where they limit the amount of people that come into it. But for the most part, I haven't seen anything supporting that it would be canceled or Sandsport for that nature. Yeah. From a vendor standpoint, I can tell you we've paid those bills. So, <laughs> You know, coming from the IT world myself, uh, there's a lot of big trade shows that go on all year. And uh, in the tech industry, they're all basically saying, you know, this is changing how we're doing it going forward. Right. And a lot of them have adopted an online you know, event uh, with a physical space where you have vehicles and uh, accessories and upgrades and all those things that you want to show off. I'm, I'm curious on how uh, the whole Corona thing is going to kind of change that landscape. Um, I don't foresee it going away uh, with such a, you know, outdoorsy type thing. I don't foresee it going away. But what I do foresee is a lot of more interest in maybe a fairgrounds type scenario versus a convention hall scenario, uh, being more um, able to spread out and be outside. Uh, those will severely, uh, they'll completely reduce the amount of liability on the event promoter to, to reduce the numbers, right? Um, when you're outside, you can have more people. You can have more space, things like that. So um, it'd be interesting to see if, I mean, Sandsport's like half outside. So. Yeah, it, it is. You know, it's it's almost like, a. I mean, you're at an expo center. It, it kind of has the vibe of a, a fairground type of event. Most of the, there's, there's only two, maybe three buildings that are actually enclosed. The, uh, the they've got like airport hangers. Is what it looks like, and uh, so. But I would say it's probably fifty fifty somewhere yeah. in that ballpark. We're always inside because it's air conditioning, and uh, I won't have it any other way. <laughs> so <laughs> you've paid your dues. It's time for AC. Yeah, I'm, nobody wants to watch me sweat. Yeah. Well, you know, it'll it'll be interesting for sure, and and I um I actually kind of look forward to how it evolves because I feel like for too many years it's been really uh, stagnant on innovation of like why people would want to be there. And I think that this will force them to make it more interesting and more unique and, uh, maybe bring in some more experiential stuff versus just booths. Um, 
So I think I think it'll be good for our industry to kind of reanalyze how they do promotion and how they do these events. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Right, for sure. You know, one thing that I did notice, though, is that the Oregon Dunes opened back up. Yep. That was good, you know, because they initially they were saying September and it is wide open now. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some limitations on some certain things that you can do. You know, most of it's going to be day use. I think if you're going to camp there, they want you to be a local, have a local registration. But there's ways around that, be it a local hotel or a, a, a campground off site. But it is good to see that they're open. Yeah, I was just reading an article that somebody on the Facebook groups linked um, about the Department of Wildlife studies on the sand travel from the dunes to the cities and they were saying that it's up it's up higher than it's ever been and it, nobody's been on the dunes yeah um so uh more more than ever they're gonna probably get real aggressive to try to have double back on that stuff and uh we as an industry as community members need to make sure we're voicing our opinion and making sure that we're representing the dooners and the and the trail riders and all that because we don't want to lose access to those uh those things that you know we have a right to be on so no question about it and you know those small towns thrive on that you, absolutely if that stuff goes away so do those small towns there, there seems to be a, a disconnect on the logic of let's take away the tourism and let the tourism survive. It's just not going to happen. Like they need to, they need to reanalyze that. I think a little bit. Right. Well, um, since we don't have our guests today, um, what, uh, what have you been doing? I know that I've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, garage cleanup and, uh, things around the house as a, as a person stuck at home. And, uh, but I've been doing a ton of video editing and, and copy editing and things like that. So I got a, a workload. I've got my, my work cut out for me. What have you been doing? Well, we took our annual trip up to Northern Idaho and did a little run up in Priest Lake. Uh, I think I put on just shy of about 200 miles. I know I need to get a hold of rock blocks because my rear tires, rear wheels uh, had no shortage of rocks that got in there and scratched them up pretty good. You discovered the uh, Can-Am 14-inch yeah, wheels. For sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, car was awesome. Yeah. So awesome. You know, I mean, you can, it's so open up there. And even with, you know, it was the most packed I've ever seen Priest Lake, and we still barely came across anybody. Yeah. And, you know, I got the, I was doing some pretty dynamic riding, and I just got a feel for the car, tons of confidence in how it was performing, and really happy so far. I'm really, really excited to see how it comes back together. But, you know, I, you, you went down with me to go pick up the car after the cage got built. Yeah. It, so we went down back down to Oregon. You're, yep. uh, Jeff, your cage builder is yep. down there. Yeah. If there's one thing that I've noticed about the cage, other than the fact that it's sick, it is, uh, the visibility is probably 30% better than on a stock X3 cage. Yeah. So the it's stock really, has that really kind good. of yeah. d- low brow domed roof yep. setup, And, uh, this brought that up horizontal with yep. the rear bar. And uh, I think you gained about probably eight inches of visibility. Yeah. I don't know the exact degree on the angle of the front window window on a stock X3, but if you look at a XP a pro XP RZR, uh, they have a little bit less of an aggressive rake right. to that front. And mine kind of, ref- my X3 kind of reflects that. And the, uh, the basically the side effect of that was increased visibility. So, right. you, you know, there's approaches that you would take on a hill climb that you really are just kind of trusting the line. And, and mm-hmm. until you get committed into that line, you don't 100% know whether or not it's going to work out. There's none of that with you know, you got complete visibility. Like there wasn't a hill climb that I did up there that I couldn't see the top of the hill. And that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. I noticed when I, when I'm driving the razor around, you know, they're not really shallow on the front, but they're still not flat out. Right. So, uh, and being a taller guy, I have a tall torso. My head's usually further up into the, the roof than most people's and, uh, going, going up a hill, you don't know where you're going for the most part. You kind of have to tilt your head a little bit. And when you're going downhill, you don't know if it's safe to floor it because you don't know if somebody's coming. Right. So visibility is a huge thing. And that's, I've considered maybe, you know, on the next rig doing one of the, um, polycarbonate roofs where you can see through or maybe getting a a metal roof with a window a sun roof just so you can see what's above you when you're going downhill and what or down and what's above you when you're going uphill we were about to do that with the x3 but we needed the roof for storage and combine that with the fact that if you wind up on your lid it could potentially crush and that was 
that was something we took into consideration. But no, I, I, I hear you. And I, I think by and large, my experience out at the sand dunes, the next time we go up there is going to be a lot different from a visibility be, standpoint. For sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really happy with the cage. It's so let's talk about the cage a little yeah. bit. Um, you know, you, you uh, your buddy Jeff down in, in Oregon is a, a fabricator and a shop guy. And uh, you went down to him with the car and said, you know, the, these are kind of the points I had. What were some of those points that you were wanting to hit? Needed to be able to store fuel, store gear, and uh, haul a spare tire. Same exact thing as with the YXE. The difference with the YXE was is he made a uh, he made a, a cage that could be detached, and that cage weighs probably about forty pounds. And um, on the rear tire, he actually built a kind of a uh, a shock apparatus where you could where you could detach it and it would flip up it would you know the hydraulic system would just flip it up into the air and you can get underneath it pull off the tire i wanted to use the tri strap that you see on a lot of baja cars right i wanted to stay, uh, keep down on weight plus the x3 doesn't have the bedroom that a lot of the other manufacturers do um uh depth wise like they're they're pretty wide they yeah go it's okay to fender, but it, it's okay depth wise though it doesn't have it's pretty the, shallow yeah it doesn't have the storage that uh that the yxz did um jeff created this cage that literally everything comes off everything like the roof comes off these tabs that come off because we didn't do a cage we didn't do a roof rack this time we did a we did tabs basically you guys are going to see pictures of it but I, I what i got was a rome adventure uh box that is uh it's called their 95l and it is three inches uh, in length less than the roof. And so what we're doing is we're going to ratchet strap those things down to tabs on the cage that are also removable. But when I say everything's removable, everything's removable. When we go out to uh, sand and it's 80 degrees outside, that roof is coming off. You know, it's, uh, he, the way that he thought about it, the way that he built it, 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 looks so appealing to the eyes yet is so practical. Like when we kit this thing out for these over overland ex, uh, expeditions, it's going to look infinitely different. You're going to have an axe mounted to it, a saw mounted to it. Uh, uh, we've got the Savage UTV case, fire extinguishers, the Rome case, the whole ball of wax. I'm not going to have a lick of gear in the cab with me. It's all got a, uh, it's all has a place. It's very well thought out. So I'm, uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out for sure. And this weekend, uh, uh, he got the, he got the glass windshield done. So this weekend. I'm going to be meeting him. We're going to go for a oh, little nice. ride out in Moses Lake. And yeah, so your cage, just so that people that aren't watching and don't see pictures of it or whatever, uh, it, it has a wraparound bumper for the back. It ha goes. Uh, it has a roof, and it has a full uh, coverage windshield, um, uh, um, an aluminum one. Yes. Yeah, with a with the with a real glass insert. Yep. And uh, it's pretty pretty unique. So the roof is held down by a handful of uh, uh, bolts, and then some of those bolts are doubled up. And those allow you to mount. The, That's where the tabs go. Where the tabs go. So yep. you have some 90 degree anchor points that you can put on your roof or take off if you choose, um, depending on what riding you're doing. And then the, the the front windshield goes under that roof, the lip. So the, the, the roof drains over the windshield. Yeah. And then that windshield's also removable if you're doing warm weather stuff. As it pertains to how it's set up right now, the only possible thing that we might change is those anchor points. We might change them from a 90 degree angle to a 45 degree angle because they're going to be load bearing and it's going to be pulling on a direction that would be best suited right. for 90 uh, for 45 degree. That is it. That cage is set, you know, and uh, we're <clears throat> for some of the runs that we're looking at doing, you know, this is actually my first glass windshield too. The last, the last one, uh, wasn't glass, got scratched up pretty good. And I, I didn't make use of it a heck of a lot. Um, this one's not only more coverage, more, uh, wind protection, it's, uh, glass. Yeah, so. so a lot of guys that are getting into UTVs are, you know, asking which windshields they should get and things like that. Even though this one's you know been custom made for your your machine, uh, there's a lot of great manufacturers out there that have OEM compatible windshields and things like that. But the thing to know is that when you get a polycarbonate windshield, uh, for one, you're not going to get a wiper system, and two, even if it's hard coated, 
it's still going to scratch. No question. And it's still going to end up fogging. And over time, you're going to want to use it less and less because it becomes more of an uncomfortable hindrance versus a you know benefit. So things like pledge, things like Rain X don't particularly work on a par- polycarbonate as well. Whereas on a glass, we don't run into those issues. Right. And there's a number of products out there that you can spray on plastic. Um, a lot of guys on motorcycles will use them for their for the windshields and things like that. But um, if you're not doing it from day one, it doesn't work as good. And when you have roost coming at you and things like that, it just deteriorates that polycarbonate instantly. So, yeah. And I've made, made mention of it before on some of the overland trips that we've made that I always, I, I seem to be a magnet for bees. And considering <laughs> that we're in this uh, this murder hornet craze, yeah. I think uh, for our next trip, I'm prob- next two trips, I'm probably going to be running the glass, even though it's 100 degrees outside. Can you imagine getting one of those at speed to the face? I oh, a murder hornet. <laughs> I got like one a of the. Rock. I got oh, no question about it. I did. I've been stung by one of those things. I by got a, I got stung by in, one of those Asian ones. Yeah, in the knee. That thing went down on my floorboard after it got me. It is no joke. Let me tell you, like uh, I was this close, you know, just a just a fraction late to killing it and getting pure joy out of its death. <laughs> but it flew off, and I've been stung so many times in my life. It's ridiculous. This one, uh, I would say it's probably thirty to forty percent harsher from a pain standpoint than a wasp. But my knee increased in size by about 15 to 20 percent yeah yeah i've never had a sting cause me to swell and uh that one did it was two to three days before the swelling went away it, it, from an in terms of it being itchy i could not stress to you how bad <laughs> that was uh, it was so itchy after it had been done but boy did it get my attention when it when it got me and uh yeah i, I all i can implore to people is when you are uh, when you're riding on trails and stuff up in the mountains, if you're not running a windshield, do not wear a hoodie. <laughs> Bees yeah. get trapped in hoodies like you wouldn't believe. And yeah, I on that trip over the course of like 600 miles or something, I got stung five times. Oh one, man, one by one of those guys, a uh, couple couple yellow jackets, and then one bumblebee or something. But it was uh, yeah. Yeah, it gets your attention. Last uh, last summer, my one of my last rides <clears throat> last summer was up to uh, up to Bunko area, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, up by Silverwood uh, theme park in the Panhandle of Idaho. And uh, we were going, and and I wear you know a moto style helmet with goggles. Um, you're a full face guy, um, and and uh, I had gotten a wasp stuck in between the pocket of air uh, between my goggles and my cheek pads and my helmet. And all I could, all I knew was that I was on my left side and all I could do is just not crash the car because I was at full speed and I was panicking and there was this little guy freaking out inside of my goggles and it's in that soft spot of your face where like once you something touches it your whole face kind of just like yep. cringes and so I'm only driving like with one eye and I'm trying to like bang my head off like this with the with the the goggles trying to get them out and then I can't see then I'm getting dust in my goggles and like all this, it was just a horrible experience but it was it was quite the experience I, I wish there was a, a GoPro running on me because I probably looked like a little school girl running around with her hair on fire I don't check my my helmet before I put it on and uh, I threw it on within the last year and I could feel something on the top of my head. I go, oh, that's, a, that's a wasp. That's not That's good. absolutely a wasp. Got lucky. It didn't sting me. And sure enough, when I pulled it off, there he is. <laughs> but yeah, got to be careful. But hoodies, hoodies yeah. are a trap for those things when you're up in the mountains. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we went down to Oregon. We picked it up, uh, the cage up. And um, what were your first, you know, I, what was your because i mean basically you gave him the car pure said, joy this is this is what i wanted these yeah. are the points i need to hit and then you left the creativity up to him yeah and that's the same way with the last one i i basically i've talked to, to anybody that's going to work with him i always just say give him the cliff notes of what you want and just leave him alone you know if there's something that you absolutely have to have on there obviously say something put uh, make sure it's mentioned and uh, he'll make it happen and he had a he had a unique challenge of putting together a cage that was going to be sufficient for what it is that we're going to do on these overland trips while also making it SEMA worthy. And again, he killed it. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome little build. And yeah. it has, um, you know, what I like about it is it's not too tall in the back. So it keeps the sleekness yeah. of the Can-Am look, 
but it's unique enough to be completely different than anything else you've seen. When people see pictures of it, they think it's tall. They think, mm-hmm. man, that's a high cage. It's two inches shorter than the stock cage because the stock cage rolls. Right. You know, it, it, it kind of has a curvature to it. And it's two inches shorter than the stock cage. And bear in mind, I'm 6'4", so it has to be a little bit tall. But I've got plenty of room in it. And uh, even with my helmet, pumper, the whole ball of wax. Ton of, yeah, plenty of clearance. And I think a lot of it has to do with that higher brow, that horizontal brow. Yeah. Um, and uh, that gives it a lot more stance vertically than a normal car you would see would have a sloped or a curved off uh, yeah. brow. Well, the X3 alway, already has a rake to it. Yep. This cage really accentuates that rake. Yep. And I think once it's loaded down with gear, it's going to look a little bit more like some sort of a off-road machine. But right now it looks like an arrow tip. Yeah. You know, it's got a, it's got a serious rake to it. Yeah. It gave it, it gave the whole front half of the car more of an arrow pointed for sure. look to for it. Sure. For sure. Um, so, uh, we got that put on, um, uh, our first thing we did with it is put on some, some new headlights yeah. uh, that you got from Baja Designs. Yep. We put the, uh, the S1 headlight kit in that thing that, uh, that didn't take as long as I thought it would, uh, Big shout out to Ben. Ben was up here for that. We were actually getting ready to go up to Priest Lake. We were heading up there the next day. And uh, we put that thing on in about 20, 30 minutes, somewhere in there. Uh, We went out to the house afterwards and kind of lined them up based on how we wanted them. And then I got to put them to the test up in Priest Lake for probably about 40 miles and just wait. Like, I, I I was so surprised, you know, you... So let's talk about what they are real quick. Yeah. Um, so they are a headlight replacement for the OEM Can-Am Maverick X3 body platform. And it is a metal shroud. Yep. Uh, to, to And then it has a slot for three uh, Baja lights, uh, three S1 lights. Yep. Uh, with two on each side being spot and one of them being a flood. Right. And um, I think they total over uh, 14,000 lumen. Yep. And uh, so it was funny because um, I have a Lux meter uh, in the garage and uh, we, we checked the, the stock headlights and we tested the hot spot about a foot away from the headlight and it registered on the meter like I think it was like 14,000 Lux or something like that. Um, and the meter goes up to 200,000 Lux. And uh, we tried just one of the S1 spotlights. It wouldn't and register. It wouldn't register. Yeah. It was off the charts. It was off the charts. So I had to go buy another one. I got a. I got one that goes up to 400 now, and uh, we'll have to check it again and see what those numbers are. But but just think about that. The stock headlights at 12 inches was roughly about, I think I'll have to double check and I'll put it on the screen if it's wrong, but I think it was around 15,000 lux, somewhere in that range. Yeah. And the uh, the S, a single S1 was off the 200,000 chart. So yep. now imagine four of those. Um, Six. Well, six of those, two of them being flood, and then four of them being spot. Um, that's a ton of light. How d- how did that translate to you? So I'm not going to say. <clears throat> I, I'll just put it in layman's terms. Basically, I took that car out at about midnight while we were up at Priest. I took my daughter and and her her buddy for a ride up there on a trail that I really knew knew quite well, pitch black and. I started to have internal dialogue as to whether or not I need any more light. That's how bright those are. So we don't even have the Onyx 6 on there yet. No, we've got nothing else on there. We've got got S1s to put on the pillar. We've got the 10-inch Onyx Plus to put on the shock tower, and we've got two LP4s to put on the front bumper. At that point... I will probably be able to be visible from Mars. <laughs> the The stock headlight replacement on there, I I was doing on this trail. I was doing seventy at one point, and uh, there's a, there's some pockets every now and then that can kind of sneak up and catch you. But it is enough light to hold that kind of speed if you know the trail pretty well. So I'm just starting to think about it, looking at uh, the the additional light that we're going to put it on. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be absolutely incredible. But that S1 kit is such a massive upgrade from uh, from the stock headlights. It's nuts. So, I would definitely recommend it on it. But the, the main reason that I would recommend it is the fact that from a power consumption standpoint, it's it's relatively, it's very reasonable for what your stator puts out. So it's a, it's a great lighting upgrade because, I mean, if you put a, X3s can house a 50-inch bar. And I just, at this point, I don't see the need for it, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if you look at <clears throat> what the... Uh, what the S1 kit puts out, you're talking over 14,000 lumen, uh, but it's only pulling 8.7 amps, uh, which translates roughly to 120 watts right. f- uh, based off of their numbers. Um, and if you look at the Onyx 6 light bar that we're going to put on your shock tower, uh, we're looking at 
uh, 12,000 lumen and um, about 8.4 amps. So it's almost double the amount of light once we get that light bar on there yep. and it's already a ton. Yep. So yeah, we're going to do a video out by my house where we're running that thing. Um, we'll run just those headlights, then we'll run the bar, then we'll run everything all in and run my car up because we've got the ability to stretch my car out at 90 miles an hour in a very, very safe environment and see what, what kind of light, what light looks like at that kind of speed. Because yeah. in Baja and desert racing, there's that, that turn out running your light. Yep. It's not going to be a factor on this car. Yeah, and and just so everybody understands that hasn't been following, um, you know, Ian's coming from a YXZ where you had a light bar and a bunch of other stuff on it, um, uh, some mirror, lighted mirrors and things like that, uh, and you kind of wanted to get away from the overhead light thing. You wanted to keep the light down low, below the eye line. Yeah, and kind of reduce some of that um, uh, that fatigue you get from the the glare that you were getting off the front end of the car. And the main thing being, I wanted to I wanted to relieve the draw off the stator at night. Yep. Cause you had a ton being pulled off of the Yamaha. Did you have a different stator on the Yamaha? Uh, the stator on the Yamaha is claimed to be roughly about what the X3 is, but I actually think the X3 is a little bit stouter. Um, I think the X3, you get something to the tune of about 30 amps at 6,000 RPM. So, I mean, that's decent enough to work 30, with 30 amps free, 30 amps free. Cause you, you've got, uh, you've got your fuel delivery, you've got your spark, you've got your power steering. That's all drawing off the stator as well. And, you know, at 6,000 RPM, I want to say at idle, it's somewhere around six to eight. My, uh, a friend of ours made mention that it's about six to eight and an idle that you have to work with. So if you're running your, if you're running your headlights and you're idling, you're running your radios, you're running your pumper at idle, you're just pulling from your battery, right? It, that ba- uh, your stator's not putting anything back into that battery at that point. So, um, but once you're up around that 5,000 RPM, 6,000 RPM threshold, you're, you're close to, uh, 30 usable amps and that's plenty to power all my lights, power my radios and still charge the battery. And that's the most important thing when you're going out for multiple days on end. Right. And that's something that the, uh, the guys that just do the low and slow driving and just cruise with the sound system bumping and, and all that stuff, that's something for them to take into consideration because again, they're pulling straight from the battery. And so they're going to have to have a ha- a stout battery platform right um and or a stator upgrade to to power it so um yeah a lot of guys don't understand that power doesn't come you know from the stator until you're at speed so right right you mentioned getting the uh the onyx six and and a couple s ones for uh some scene lighting on the side i think uh we also have a rtl to go on the back yep uh chase light and uh, any other lighting things you might want to be doing? From a lighting standpoint, that's it. We do have some rock lights to put on that thing. We've got some interior lights to put on that thing. Um, we've got we've got a lot of work to do. Just it yeah. is what it is. You know, uh, we've got uh, there's a couple pieces of gear. Uh, I feel like we're kind of under. I'm, I'm a little bit un, under a crunch to kind of get this because we're about 35 to 40 days from a pretty big expedition that uh, I've got uh, I've got doors coming in, an entire new center console coming in. We've got uh, a homebrew um, dual battery kit that we have to install with the help of these guys right here. I'm pointing at my hat, uh, Melee Design Firm. They, oh my gosh, I should have just sent you a picture of the, 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 the tray that, he, that they built. So it's, a, it's a awful. battery tray for the second. That's going to gonna go be a talking seat. point unto itself. It's, yeah. it, I, don't, I don't even want to put it in. Like I want to put it on my desk and put a mocked up full throttle <laughs> battery. It's that pretty. Yeah. <laughs> it is so cool. Um, but basically what Bailey does is they build these battery trays so that you can save weight on rally cars and uh, take, you know, you take your stock battery, which weighs like 35 pounds and you replace it with a battery that weighs 12 and it's still enough to start your car. They make the trays to put, to house those batteries. Well, a caveat of that is that you can also use it for a, for a dual battery kit. So what we're looking at doing is we're looking at uh, taking that tray, putting it in the X3, and then putting an isolator from Red Arc on that to protect the starting battery. So I'll have, I'll have the better part of uh, creeping up on 62 amp hour on the car and... Uh, basically have you know the red arc like i said it'll protect the starting battery but uh so the, so the red arc so that people that don't understand what that it's is a battery it's a, isolator it's a battery isolator yeah. yeah red arc uh you you find red arc predominantly in the like the toyota off-road scene and uh for dual battery setup so what the red arc is designed to do it's designed to protect your starting battery in the event that it dips below 12.7 at which point it'll shut that 
it'll shut any access, any power draw to that starting battery once it hits that 12.7 so that the next day you get up, you can still fire your car up. At that point, any sort of power demand diverts for your, to your auxiliary battery. So the need to charge up your auxiliary battery becomes that much more important, but it also, you, you have to take into consideration that if you do have a major draw when you fire up that car in the morning, that battery, that auxiliary battery that's been drained on all night is about to command a massive amount of power, massive amount right. of juice off that stator. So, but that, uh, that isolator is no joke. I'm really excited to the best of my knowledge. Red Arc's never put one on a side-by-side before and ours is going to be the first. So yeah, that's going to be rad. That. Yeah. With the isolator, what kind of batteries are you going to uh, be replacing? I'm assuming we're replacing the stock battery with a full throttle battery. So the the stock battery is a it's a tiny little 20 amp hour battery. Hor- anybody that owns an X3, anybody that owns a side by side knows by and large the batteries that come with these things from the OE they're not adequate once you start apl- uh, putting on accessories. So stock battery is a little 20 amp hour. We're replacing it with a 35 amp hour. It's called a full throttle FT438 U1R. And with a bracket that was uh, that was fabricated and made by Addiction Motorsports down in Woodland, Washington, we'll throw that guy in there, and, it, and it'll work with the existing hardware. The Melee Design Kit will house; it's fit perfectly for a FT410, which is a 28 amp hour. It's a, technically a starting battery. And uh, we can mount that in any orientation. So I kind of want it visible. So we're probably going to put it right behind the passenger seat. There's plenty of room to do so. And it comes with its own bracket to get so you can get creative from a mounting standpoint. So like I said, uh, we've got 28 and 35 amp hour to play with. So and from a cranking from a cranking capacity standpoint, the FT410 will start a Cummins diesel all day easily. um, And we're basically putting two of them in. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that, uh, we were, we were talking battery and power and, and all that because, uh, we went out to Idaho to, I took my kids to Cabela's and, uh, we went to the gas station afterwards and, uh, there was a Maverick sport, an old, an old timer was at filling up his Maverick sport. Uh, he had driven, you know, in Idaho street legal to the gas station. Uh, and I asked him how he liked it and he's, oh, yeah, it's a pretty great machine. And then, uh, two seconds later he, uh, he couldn't start his car. <laughs> wow. It was the first time he had started it over the winter. And uh, so he was just getting all the dust off of it, getting it filled up with gas. Uh, but he, what he didn't take into consideration is the fact that his battery wasn't charging all winter and there was no trickle charge. There was no tender on the, on the machine. So even though he was able to get it started, the starting process took up all the reserve battery power it had. And by the time he got to the gas station, the stator wasn't enough to fill the battery enough to start it a second time. Right. And so just because you can start it the first time, if it's a little slow starting, just plan on stopping what you're doing and putting some juice back in the battery. Any battery, any battery from small power sport all the way up to a semi. If you aren't going to be using that thing for about 45 days, plan on putting a trickle charger on it of some sort. I, I don't like trickle chargers. I like smart chargers. Um, What's the tri- difference? Well, well, smart char- trickle charger, smart charger have a lot of the same technology, but trickle charger, when I hear trickle charger, I assume you're talking somewhere between 1.5 to 3.5 amps. For a power sport battery, that's adequate. For a car battery, it's not. Essentially, it's tickling it. So the rule of thumb is you take the battery's amp hour capacity rating. That can range, let's take a golf cart battery. That's usually 200 or more, somewhere between 200 and 250, or I'm sorry, 200, 225, 230, somewhere in that ballpark. You want to put 20% back in. So you want, essentially what you want is you want a, uh, you want a charger that can handle that. So 12 volt battery, RV battery, just make it as simple as possible. 100 amp hour. You want a charger that can put 20 amps back in, basically a 20 amp charger. So that's the rule of thumb is somewhere between 10 to 20% back into the battery and 10% is totally adequate. 20% is ideal. And so as far as the actual technology that puts the battery juice back into the battery, like what's the difference between maybe some smart, uh, is it Norcal? Norcal? Noco. Noco. Yeah. Uh, between like something like that or maybe one that you just find at Walmart. So um, I haven't ch- shopped for a a battery charger at Walmart ever. So I'm not sure what they're marketing, (laughs) but uh, there's two different types of chargers. There's a linear charger and there's a switch mode charger. A linear charger takes the positive current out of the outlet and puts it back into the battery. Switch mode will take positive and negative current and put it back into the battery. Switch mode charger is the same thing, same type of charging technology that you have in your cell phone. So 
in theory, and it's not even a theory, this is exactly what it is, a switch mode charger will charge your, charge your battery in half the time using half the power. So it's so. taking that alternating current and basically just making it all direct straight into the battery. Right, right. Now, depending on which charger company that you speak with, an actual charge profile, which a charge profile is you have 8 billion different forms of battery chemistry that all have a unique charge profile that they like to receive. So you'll hear these different stages you know, well, we've got a seven stage charger. Basically what that means is it's got float bulk absorption type charge. Basically it's, it's throwing power at the battery in a different manner built on that battery's engineering and its ability to receive that charge. This is all blither blather, you know, <laughs> and depending on what electrical engineer you're talking with, people, I've, I've heard, I've heard electrical engineers saying anybody that tells you that there's more than five stages is full of it. And then have another electrical come, engineer come in 30 minutes later and say, ours is 13 stages. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Stuff like that. So the reason that I like the NOCO and the SeaTech chargers is they're, they're pretty versatile. You know, if you want to charge a golf cart battery, it'll do it. You want to charge lithium, it'll do it. You want to charge AGM, uh, the NOCO, I mean, there's certain battery manufacturers out there odyssey that if you're using a noco charger they'll actually deny a warranty because they say that it doesn't top it off in a manner that they approve of really that's just denying warranty that's all that is hmm. it, it's it's garbage you know the noco charge algorithm the noco charge profile is adequate for any battery chemistry known to man it and the accessories as it pertains to the power sport market the accessories that they have available to make it easy for people this is ctech and noco can't be beat so uh like the the noco stuff that i'm familiar with um is the the battery packs that have the ability to jump start something boost pack yeah um so they they had like the boost xl or whatever that thing's pretty popular um and i think that's getting a little popular in the utv scene as well people are starting to, to pack those around as well um noco, right. noco couldn't sell a boost pack if the consumer knew how well that thing was designed to protect them you can't crop, you basically, you can't uh, do a reverse polarity on it. It won't spark. If you put it on reverse polarity, it'll protect its, it'll, it'll protect you from your mistake. The cabling on it is so adequate that you could literally jump one car after another, multiple cars after another. Those cables might get a little bit warm, but they're not going to melt. The, the charge pack isn't going to catch fire, whereas there's a lot of charge packs out there that do, especially you notice that at like used car lots. Right. Guys will go out and they'll have like eight cars that are dead. By the third one, that charge pack is incinerated. Mm. NOCO fixed all that stuff. NOCO, NOCO's boost pack, if you forget that it's under the hood and drive off and it, and it disconnects and you then run that pack over... It has a, it has like a cr the ability to receive a little bit of crush, and once it senses that, it'll turn a light on. It'll turn a freaking flashlight on, so that when you come <laughs> back to your house, you see this flashlight sitting in your driveway. Yeah, like it at is nighttime, so, you forget a lot of that stuff, and you don't see it to pick it up. And yeah, that'd be a great option. The Noco has one protection feature on it that stumps people, and that's it. And what it is is if your battery pack is so low, it's protecting you from it. It won't. Boost your it won't battery. discharge too you much. have to tell it to you have to press that uh that exclamation point and hold it down for something to the tune i mean a literal 10 seconds and you'll hear a click and then you fire your car up mm -hmm. but from in terms of how well it's designed and how well it's built to protect you you'd be hard pressed to find a better piece of equipment um now they have a few different sizes and things like that i mean they have are, are you familiar enough with them oh, to yeah. be able to recommend them yeah Conventional power sport's going to be GB20, and the GB20 has the smallest alligator clips, and uh, it just makes it accessible. So like the battery, on my, stock battery on my Can-Am is going to be easily attached to from that GB20, and then they'll go up to like a GB3. Uh, I don't think, I, I can't remember that. what's the biggest. It might be like a 150. Uh, they go to GB500. Yeah, but, so uh, I've seen a 150 start a combine. A combine? A combine. Those are... that a lot of juice yeah that's a pretty big <laughs> diesel motor in there yeah, yeah no question about it so uh, me personally i have a gb40 it spends most of its time charging up my playstation controller and my phone <laughs> so so these also have like usb ports and things oh, yeah. on them that you can use for your yep. other devices um now mind you those are lithium based 
charge prax. So lithium doesn't have a heck of a lot of reserve capacity. So, you know, if they tell you that you're going to get five cell phone charges off of it, you'd be lucky to. Mm. Okay. So, um, so it's not about the capacity per se. It's just about the, the ability to discharge fast enough to do what you need to do. Correct. So, uh, we're going to be doing some, some trail riding soon. Um, I was thinking about maybe getting one of those at one point. So it sounds like maybe the GB 40, uh, would be a good compromise between size and value. Every car that's in your driveway right now can be started off that GB 40 and, uh, it's perfect for your RZR. Awesome. Yep. So uh, I'll uh, put a link down below for those that are interested in those um, to the NOCO uh, Boost packs. Yeah. And so if you're interested in looking at those or buying one of those, uh, hit that link down below. We'll get a little bit of a credit from Amazon. And um, yeah. Another thing to consider too is they actually, I can't, the part number is like a GC0016. I think that's what it is. And what it is, is uh, it, it makes use of a rocker switch. And it'll give you a real-time state of health on your battery. So if that thing's green, you got a fully uh, full charge on your battery. But the the most critical component to that rocker switch is you take your little NOCO Genius charger and you plug it in on your dash, not at the battery. Oh. And that's how you plug your trickle charger in. So it, you can have the whole connection set up down to the battery yep. all pre-installed. And all you have to do is just run a cord from plug the wall. Plug it into your dash. Yeah, you don't have to expose the battery to charge it. Uh, looks like a GBC, uh, is for the cables and then, uh, yeah, we'll find the switch somewhere. Yeah. So we'll, we'll link all that stuff down below in the show notes. Uh, if you're not familiar with our show notes, we do put uh, bookmarks in the YouTube video so you can jump, uh, straight to the video anywhere you want in the podcast, uh, in the audio form. Um, you can, uh, at least have a guide to where to jump around if you want it. Uh, but also we include all the show links. So anytime we have a podcast that mentions anything, besides just talking to each other, we link that down below so that you can get straight to that product, that service, that website, that event, that manufacturer, whatever the case is. So um, we talked about the, the lights going on the car. Um, we talked about you're going to get some new doors, center console. And the big reason for the center console is because we, we just have a lot more to stuff to be going on, right? So we have a GPS to mount on there. Uh, which GPS are you going to be running? Uh, TRX-7 Magellan. I've been running it for two years. And uh, it has every trail I've ever done saved in it. It uh, The whole COVID thing has really given me an opportunity to go through everything that it possibly has from a feature standpoint. And uh, it, it can be a little buggy from time to time, just being honest. It uh, it's froze up a couple of times, but every time uh, every time I've ever fired it right back up on a restart, and this this is less than five times in 3,500 miles, you know, so it's really first world problems. Um, it picks up senses where I'm at and it picks up right where it left off. So it's, it's a good piece of equipment. No doubt about it. I, I feel real good about it. So. Do you feel that those, uh, those freezings may have been heat related or no. do you think it was just buggy software at the I, time? I think it was buggy, just buggy software, you know, and, uh, I, I did, uh, I, you know, you can upload GPX files to it and it's all cloud-based. So if you have a Magellan profile and you just log into your profile on their website, throw on a GPX file into your profile the next time your TRX-7 senses a Wi-Fi connection, it'll pull that down automatically. Gotcha. That stuff's pretty handy. Yeah, that'd be really nice to have the car in the garage and just be yeah. able to, to load it up. There's one thing that it doesn't, I mean, there's one, very, very few GPSs will do this. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the day where we can track each other, where I can see you on the trail. Right. And there is a, there is a trail tech GPS. It's kind of yep. small because it's made for uh, adventure riders yep. on motorcycles. Um I'm waiting for that to be more standardized. That's going to be awesome. That, I, don't, I don't know how much standardized it's going to be because Polaris owns Trail Tech and uh, they're sure. patent, patent, patent frenzy all over that stuff. Right, so. right. I know it has a lot of similarities between the uh, Polaris Ride Command versus uh, right, what so. Trail Tech does. But from what I was told, it does not, you know, because Ride Command has to have cell service to operate. So the Trail Tech doesn't. So here's the interesting thing about that. So Polaris acquired Trail Tech a few years back. And uh, they were seeing the technology they were developing and, and said, this is a great thing. We want to put it in our vehicles across the board. So slingshot, Indian motorcycles, uh, Polaris razors, things like that, right? So they had the, the ride command and it was a pretty standard nav system. It used a cellular network and you had to, you know, go off your phone to get it basically. Um, and then this last year they came out with the Pro XP mm -hmm. and that featured the ability to basically self cell tower. So it would create its own cell signal on the antenna 
and then that would communicate between the two vehicles or multiple vehicles. And so the technology they're using to do that came from trail tech. Yeah. And so basically what you're getting is um, a cell service lists multiple vehicle tracking system because each vehicle is a cell tower. Right. And uh, what I was told by the trail tech rep that if you're within eight miles, you will pick them up. As long as there's no huge mountain between you. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Because it doesn't bounce off cell towers. So like if you're trying to triangulate around a mountain, that's not going to work. It costs exactly what my Magellan costs as well. I know the Magellan's come down in cost a little bit over the last couple of years. Uh, I think I was into mine for something like 500 and I think you can get it for three or 400 now. Uh, the trail tech's going to cost you about that 400, 450, uh, maybe it might even be more. Um, but as far as trail techs, uh, available trails that populate the way that the Magellan populate, I'm not real familiar with their model. Right. I, I would really believe me, my brother and I have actually we wanted to get our hands on one of those for two yeah. years. I, I think I've actually no been brand. trying to get one uh, up until this last fall, um, and I wasn't able to get one without you know going through a dealer to get it. So yeah. um, the, uh, the the unit we're talking about is the Voyager Pro. Yep, it's a four inch uh, color touchscreen unit that also has a, a handful of uh, physical buttons as well. Uh, but it also can do so. It's a full color screen. Does your nav maps? Does your waypoint tracking? All that kind of stuff. It also does media. Uh, so if you want to tie it into speakers and and all that kind of stuff, you can do your music and all that off there. Um, so uh, pretty interesting units. They run about six hundred bucks. Um, and they have a whole handful of accessories for mounting using RAM mounts, things like that. We could dedicate an entire, we could probably dedicate two hours just talking about various GPS software as I've used, I've used the Magellan. I want to use the trail tech. Uh, the one that I'm most interested in is HEMA. Um, and then there's uh, Gaia. I've used Gaia on my Gaia maps are pretty yep. popular Gaia. Uh, I used it for the Washington BDR because I didn't know at the time how to pre-program a route into my Magell- Magellan. I used the guy at a nav. And then once we reach our, uh, our destination, the Magellan got me out because it leaves breadcrumbs. It follows you everywhere that you go. So, um, but yeah, the HEMA one is the one that I wanted to use the most. It's real popular with overlanders. Uh, you know, there, there is a route up in British Columbia that I want to do. And, uh, there's a group that I've kind of loosely worked with that do overland trails and they do trail mapping for HEMA. They actually did this one. It's called the McKenzie trail, which would be one of the shortest expeditions I've ever done, but by far the gnarliest. <laughs> so I really would like to make that happen. But yeah, it just, so they, HEMA is just the maps, right? It's not correct. the actual device. You can get a device from them. Oh, do they sell yeah, devices? It's tablet based if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, there's, how many times on a thread have you seen somebody ask for a recommendation for GPS? It's, it's something that usually gets populated about once per day and you'll get 18 billion different answers. And most of the people that are answering are answering on something that didn't cost them anything. It was free. Right. And they'll say that, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's the best. Well, that's when you haven't tried everything else, right? Correct. Yeah. That, that's subjective. The best, the best for me. And and, you know, one, one company that we've never met that we haven't mentioned is Lawrence, you know, and uh, I've always been told that Magellan for trails, Lawrence for racing, and I assume Lorance for racing because it's fast. You know, you can overshoot a trail on a Magellan because right. like, if you're so, going 80 miles an hour, you're going to miss a turn. So one thing with GPS is, is the Hertz yep. that it refreshes at. Yep. And if it's not refreshing fast enough and then processing it fast enough, uh, it could be multiple seconds behind you. No question. No yeah. question. Yeah, uh, I have. I can't speak to Lawrence. I've never. I've really never heard anything bad about it at all. And I've always wanted to play with it. Right. You know, I mean, it's real common on uh, charter boat fish. You know, fishing vessels Marine, and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'd, I know I'd be that really interested. Uh, with their their newer units, they have some pretty big screened color touchscreen units, yeah. and I've heard a lot of good things about the UI on them. Uh, but I've also heard some really uh, sketchy stuff on the durability of those screens and really? the glass behind it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, need, I have not used it personally to be able to say that. It's just what I've heard. I can tell you firsthand from the, on the TRX-7, the Magellan, that thing has been blasted in its face with a pressure washer more times than I can count. And it is just fine. Just keeps on going. So that that's... Is that, that unit waterproof? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not as advertised. I don't know. Um, it works. I can tell you that. So. Okay. 
So we got the uh, we got a, an abundance of lighting switching to figure out. Yep. We had the GPS to to mount. Um, there's the rugged radios. radios that we're putting in. You got a 60 watt unit to put in there. Is it the UHF or VHF? I believe it's the VHF. Okay. Yeah. Don't quote me. And then that me. that includes uh, also an intercom system for the for the car. Car. Yep. The 696 car to car. So, and I, I ran a similar setup on my YXE and it is one of the first modifications I want to make on any new machine I jump into. That is so handy. <laughs> yeah. Being able to communicate just makes life so much easier. For sure. And especially when you're doing long, long range trail riding, you don't want to always be in the dust behind the guy. If you can step back a mile or two and avoid that dust and, and have your own good, clean air experience, you're yep. going to do it. And so, um, yeah, not having to wait for people at, at landmarks, you know, that's a great advantage of having good comms. Um, and then just the ability to, to clearly identify oncoming traffic and obstacles, you know, Hey, look out for, you know, this rock at the fence, you know, it's going to get you right. Those types right. of things. Mostly what we call out is turns. You just know. off turning off the for road. Sure. Yep. And uh, so we have a lot of things to put on the dash, basically, is what we're saying. And so... Starting to feel a little pressure, you know? We're 40 days out from a big trip, and uh, we've got some stuff that needs to show up, um, a couple of things that need to get ordered, and they have to get ordered based on what shows up, Right. you know? Uh, Had a few things happen, like I I think I was telling you, uh, my uh, winch synthetic rope, my winch winch cable broke, yep, which is a great thing, you know? It, it be, best to do it at my house towing out my dad's Chevy than it is uh, <laughs> out in Idaho. So, yeah, I was real thankful when that happened. So I got a, I got a, I can't remember the name of the company, but it was rated like 17,000 pounds or something. It's right. a quarter, we're going from a three sixteenths to a quarter inch synthetic rope, uh, American made. Um, yeah, I want to say the stock on the Can-Am X3 was rated about 7,500. So it's a signif- low. significant jump. And then you're going to be throwing a, a factor 55 uh, link on the end of that, right? It's Slide already link. on it. Yep. Yeah. It, it's on it currently. Uh, I also put a, a factor 55 fair lead. Why? Cause it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Better <laughs> than stock. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, factor 55 is we, we've talked about it. They make yeah. cool stuff. So. so we have a lot of wiring to do. We There's do. a lot of endpoints to be tying in. Um, and we had discussed, you know, doing a full harness kit to to tie everything into switches yep. on the dash and and you know when you get that new custom dash you know how many switch placements are you going to need things like that yeah uh but maybe we're going a different route possibly we'll see you know it, it sounds like we might be doing something with switch pros on the uh the rcr force 12 and uh, if that if that pans out that's going to be just such a relief right and yeah. that's uh is that 16 17 outputs 12 12 yeah I thought it was more than that. It might, you might, yeah, I have to look it up. I'm not 100% sure. But uh, so basically, it's a controller that's solid state. And uh, so it has 12 buttons, which is why it's called the Force 12. Uh, but it has more than 12 outputs, like gotcha. as far as relays and switching. So you can do 17 outputs, uh, four are rated at 35 amps. So if you have a big sound system, that would be one of them. If you have, you know, super high output lights all the way around the car, that could be a different one. Uh, but you also have one rated at 30 and 11 rated at 15. So most of your accessories that you buy for a UTV are going to fall in that category of 15 amps. Yeah. And then it has one low side rated at two amps. So if you're doing just basic switching that you don't need to put an actual power output to, uh, that's what you can use that for. So the interesting thing is that 150 amps complete maximum rate, you can take any of those channels and map them together on a button to do either, you know, momentary latching, uh, strobing. You can do sequential things like that. The, the, the pro 12 is, is pretty configurable and it's all via the, uh, Bluetooth. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I, that was a that was a big relief when that started to develop because it was something we'd been uh, looking at uh, fuse blocks, all kinds of different options of what we we're going to have to right. do, and it was going to you know we were going to have to do some customization to pull all that off, and uh, this solves it hundred yeah. percent. It just uh, it's it's going to be a I mean we're going to probably dedicate an entire video to just to what that thing's going to be able to yeah. do, yeah, to what it's going to be able to do. I mean. Total management. I mean, uh, the the only thing that I don't have in my possession right now that uh, besides that center console and the doors uh, that has to get wired up, you know, I mean, basically everything that's arriving is going to run through this. You've got whips, uh, 
I, I initially didn't think I was going to run a pumper kit and now I'm sold on it. Right. After riding. Well, you have a pumper helmet. <laughs> I have a pumper helmet, but you know, I was riding with some pretty fast guys out at Moses Lake and, uh, I was literally just trusting that the trail was there. It was so dirty. I was, right. on, I was on their heels and you just couldn't see, but two feet in front of you. If, I mean, there was a points where you couldn't see the dat or see, see the front end of my car. Right. And, uh, I was and just wearing sunglasses. Especially <laughs> if you end up putting a windshield on or anything, it just yeah. kicks up on there. And oh, for sure. You're not going to be able to for see sure. it. So, so pulling back is, is a huge deal. Yeah. I, I think uh, of the 12 switches available on that thing, we're probably going to use them up. Yeah. They're, they're going to be they're going to be put to use. And yeah, so for sure. That'll be an interesting install, and it completely changes the wiring diagram. Right. Um, and one of the big benefits of a solid, state, a solid state controller like this is that it simplifies everything, like you just said. Uh, it takes the relays out of the equation. So 100%. relays are one of the first things to fail when people yep. get, get wet is they, they submerge a relay and then it's shot. And so your lights don't turn on anymore or you'll get your like your LED bar flickering because you're hitting bumps. And, uh, and, uh, and so then you have fusing that becomes into play as well. So the, the, a, a solid state system like this will have one large fuse, right? Like straight from the battery. So right. you'll run a large gauge wire, uh, straight to this unit. And then this unit will distribute the power through its controller. And the controller is not very big. It's, it's literally like, you know, a little six bigger, inches about or so the size of a cell phone, maybe. In yeah. The, about yeah. the size of a cell phone. Yeah. And it's a little not bigger, like but... even the thickness of it's about that. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's one control cable up to the button unit that you can put anywhere on your dash. Yep. Um, and then uh, you can put it above you, below you. It doesn't matter at that point because you're just running a control wire. Right. right. So huge, uh, huge benefit to an install like this where you have tons of wiring to do and this eliminates half of it. Yep. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, we can get all that stuff dialed in and knock it out in about a week or so. Yeah, so it'll probably take a day to, to pull her apart and clean her up and get all the priest lake mud out of the drive line and all that stuff. It might take more than a day, but <laughs> my, uh, my neighbors will love the additional dirt and mud into the drains. That was actually on my to-do list for tomorrow. So gotcha. Yeah. Or at least get a good chunk of it out of there. I mean, there's still some Winchester Bay sand in there. So yeah, my, yeah. uh, so uncle Ben took his razor from my garage, uh, this last week, weekend, Memorial weekend, went up to, uh, North Idaho to go ride. And uh, he, he he had mentioned that he needed to clean out all the sand because uh, his fiance wasn't going to enjoy the <clears throat> the roost from the sand going in her face. And I was like, well, I already washed it like twice. Yeah. <laughs> Once you get sand, you never lose it. You really don't. I mean, I've got sand in my truck still from our trip to Winchester. It's, yeah. Uh, it likes to likes to linger. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did. I, I repaired the uh, the re, the uh, shifter cable on the razor, and when I did that. Uh, it was already washed and then I had ended up having to vacuum all the sand out again. And then when I was done and put it all back together, more sand fell out and had to vacuum that out. And then Ben had to vacuum it out. It just never ends. It never does. It never does. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that thing coming together. It, uh, it's going to take a, a much different shape by this time at the end of June or, or you know, it has to be ready. We have no yeah. other choice. We got some <laughs> got big a, things coming up. Got a few things going on. We got a bunch of iron wiring to do on the razor as well. Uh, we got to get some comms in it. Yep. Um, I have handheld comms, but uh, an in dash will be definitely a better solution. We want you at a minimum of twenty five watts. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so hopefully we can get everything prepared. Get a few of the little things that are worn out. Uh, I got uh, the re- the replacement uh, buttons and such for the uh, the primary and secondary clutches on the razor, so that'll be uh, a video as well. Uh, we'll do that probably do a clutch kit as well, um, and wiring uh, fix all the wiring on it, get it all up to snuff, and then I think our ball joints. Um, I think we need to replace our ball joints. Yeah. Yeah. You hear some conflicting information about when the first service is due on an X3. Like I've heard guys doing it 500, doing it a thousand. Wow. We're right on the threshold of that 500 right now. And, you know, that's another thing that I'm going to do before we go into our first trip is uh, knock that out. Yeah. You got to get your brake and oil changed. Yep. Uh, that's usually between three and 500 miles. Well, three. Uh, I want to s- man, do not quote me and do not give me hate if I'm wrong here, but uh, I want to say it's a thousand somewhere in that ballpark. And uh, if it's a thousand, I'm changing it at 500. Yeah. You know, the way I, I'm pretty hard on things. So it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> you, you didn't take the it. slow and easy uh, break in no, procedure. No, I, I pinned it, but um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's gonna, it's got, it's got a long list of stuff to get done. Hopefully we can knock it out in the better part of a week. And you know, the first service and stuff, 
I'm debating. I, I don't think I'm going to have a dealer do it. That's one of those things. A dealer is going to want it at mo- on Monday <laughs> and yeah. return it on a Friday. Yeah, so, that's, that's one thing. Um, I don't know. That's something important for people to consider because yeah. it really does deter. It kind of changes the tra- trajectory of your warranty when it comes to that. So um, if you're concerned with an OEM warranty, if anybody's ever watched our content that works at one of these dealerships, they're going to deny my warranty anyway. <laughs> Before we so, walk in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are somebody out there right. that's considered with your OEM warranty, uh, you got you can't be flashing your ECU. You have to do your uh, oil change with the dealer so that they can log it in the OEM's database. Sure. If it's not in the database as perf- uh, performed by the dealer, the OEM can deny you any warranty after that. Right. Right. So, yeah, um, hopefully we can get everything done, taken care of, buttoned up uh, before the end of next month uh, because we got a big ride coming up. Got a couple big rides coming up. Uh, I would say, what are we looking at, 60 days for two two rides, two pretty ambitious projects? We're about a month out on the first ride. So where's the first ride at? The first ride we are going to put in, uh, I'm probably going to try and get us to put in somewhere around Cascade, Washington, which is uh, just due west of... Yakima Sila. Mm-hmm. And we might stage out of there, but we might also stage out of uh, nor- the northern Cascades, probably about an hour to two hours sh- shy of the Canadian border. That's going to make a 700 or a 600 mile trip, 1200 miles, but it's still relatively fast. Um, so we're going to be doing the Washington BDR again, mm-hmm. and that's going to be the trial run. I'm uh, really looking forward to it. It's it's some good riding. It's it can be violent at times. You know the the trails in Washington are not kept the way that they are kept in Idaho, and I'm really looking forward to it. I I, I think you're going to have a blast. As as far as it, you're no stranger to off roading. Nope. But camping off the machine, you're going to find out what you like, what you don't like. You know, my rule of thumb is is always what it it's always what it has been, which is lay out what you want, then get rid of thirty three percent of it. Yep. You know, and then lay that out. And then get rid of another 10 to 15% of it <laughs> and then pack up and go. The bare minimums. Yep. Yep. Yeah. If, so, you, uh, if you can't wear it, eat it, or, uh, you know, obviously like a tie rod <laughs> where or are we going with that? <laughs> if you can't wear it or eat it, you, you might question whether or not you need it. Right. So. Yeah. So you've already done the BDR with Ben on yep. your YXZs and uh, you did a south to north run. Yep. And this one's a little bit different. We're going to be taking a couple guys with us and uh, we're going to be starting up north and going as far south as we can, correct? Well, if it was just us, we would start in the south and go north and, and get to have somebody retrieve us. Yeah. Um, based on logistics and logistical challenges with some folks that may or may not be coming with us, uh, it's probably easier to start in the north. Yeah, and there's um, <clears throat> there's a few different yeah. loadout spots that work out better and yeah. the timing of everything. We've got some uh, Southern California boys that are going to be coming with us on this trip. Uh, they're more accustomed to sand dunes, racing, and this is kind of going to be their first like overland type venture. They're no stranger to off-road, but uh, this is going to be yeah. a lot of fun. It'll be a good, it'll be a good time it's for be sure. A great so time. We'll be doing a lot of media and a lot of content, uh, yep. vlog style, as well as produced content uh, to go on the on the YouTubes. And we can do a lot of live stuff too, because believe it or not, on the Washington BDR, there is insane amounts of cell coverage. Yeah, it just blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 west half of Washington has been pretty well saturated with cell service. So it it's, is. It's pretty good. And part of it is you're you're so close to big towns. Like when you look at uh, other BDRs, like the Idaho BDR, the biggest town that you come to is actually in Montana. Yeah. You know, whereas uh, uh, and I want to say over the course of fourteen hundred miles, you've got stretches of I would say a thousand of those miles is nowhere near civilization. Whereas Washington. You're never more than a two hour ride away from a big tit- big city. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, the nice thing about that is you also are kind of, you know, on a range, right? So, you have, you can go left or right in a lot of those situations and find somewhere to, to land. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. So, that's our first run. And uh, that's going to be really interesting. We got a lot more content uh, around that coming, uh, to the lead up to that, the preparation, things like that. And then uh, we're going to follow that up with a bigger trail uh, later. About a month or so later. Yeah, we are going to be running from Jarbridge, Nevada, up to the Canadian border. So, yeah. 1,400 miles. That is uh, through the Bitterroots, through the Frank Church, Rocky Mountain section. Um, I've never done it before. Really looking forward to it. Most uh, adventure bike riders take somewhere in the ballpark of seven to nine days. Some of the content that I've been looking at within the last 
few days guys were wrapping it up in a, in that time frame in um in about that nine day if you're a great rider you can probably do it in seven um mind you this is guys that are putting up content as throwback thursdays and stuff because as it sits right now we're in we're in mid we're in late uh, may you couldn't do this run right you're gonna get snow yeah you're gonna get snowed out on a number of sections but i don't know that this run's ever been done before on a utv and uh, that's how we like it yeah so it's gonna be a lot of fun there's i mean idaho's got a lot of character a lot of lookout towers a lot of fire lookouts you know the frank church the frank church by and large is the most desolate i mean this side of yellowstone is about the most desolate forest you're gonna find in the united states um one thing that uh you know when we get over the top of interstate 84 and start heading north i think there's about a thousand mile gap there where we might hit cell service for about an hour yeah you know it's it's remote so i'm really looking looking forward to it it. yeah (laughs) yeah so uh yeah we got those rides coming up uh, along with a a couple of events later this year that it got rescheduled that we'll we'll hit up and be on location for yep um i know you'll be doing a few things with full throttle and and then we're going to be doing a whole bunch of things with side by side guys yep uh so podcasting recording all sorts of stuff. Yeah, the uh, part of the part of the Idaho BDR is a section called the Magruder Corridor. I'm actually going over that five times in the next four months, which is <laughs> look. I, I, it's not the type of run that I want to wear out, but it looks like I'm kind of trending that direction. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we're gonna. It's gonna be interesting. So we're doing it on the Idaho BDR just by default, and I'm going over and back where we're guiding because uh, you were planning on going on that, weren't you? I the, think so. Yeah. yeah, late August. That is, uh, we're going to be guiding somewhere to the tune of about thirty people over. Oh that. right, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was I was lost. But yes, yeah. the the large group that we're going to be doing. Yeah, best case scenario, we go from Darby, Montana to Yellow Pine and back. It's probably not going to work out that way because guys like to party. But yeah. uh, uh, and then I'm doing it with some friends in mid September, and mid September is always a really interesting time to do that run because it's going to get very cold. It's winter, interesting because around that time in there. our area, it gets really hot, right? Yeah. And so getting that elevation probably is a nice break from the riding we would be typically doing. I've done that run on the first to second week of September and had it uh, almost hit zero at night. Really? Yep. Up that high? Yep. Yeah. I mean, parts of that run, you're up around 8,500 feet, somewhere in there. And uh, like I said, it's remote and it's high and uh, it, it always presents a kind of its own unique challenge. Well, uh, we got a lot more information coming on on all that stuff, and we'll bring everybody along for the ride for sure. Um, we'll be posting, obviously, uh, recorded content where we produce it and, and edit it down to an adventure video. But uh, it'd be interesting to maybe even do some podcasting from up there. Not that it would be live or pushed out at that moment, but uh, it might be some fun, interesting stories to have. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, you know the audio and stuff might be not to the quality that you guys are all used to, but... You know, if we're on if we're on scene, kind of going over what it is that we're seeing and kind of how our gear is performing, uh, it's all good stuff. Yeah. Well, depending on how many cars we have, we might have more space for equipment or whatever. For sure. We might make make something happen. For sure. But uh, yeah, so uh, looking forward to the next couple months. It's gonna be busy for us. We got a lot of garage work to do. We got a lot of prepping to do. Um, logistics mapping. Uh, insane amount of garage work to do <laughs> yeah i mean if we can knock it out in a week i'm going to be really really happy yeah it's going to take a, a focus for sure so. no question uh well uh this was kind of an impromptu podcast just because we had some cancellations and whatnot and uh it's been a lot of fun to get back face to face good to be back in together. the studio for sure yeah so uh it's always a good time to be in person with someone instead of a remote and having to wait on a zoom delay and all right. that other stuff so i noticed covid didn't kick any of my mannerisms either i noticed it when i i say for sure like a lot <laughs> like i'll listen to it it's like for sure for sure yep yep, yep. <laughs> totally <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah it's been fun uh we'll be recording here shortly hopefully with our guests that had to reschedule uh so that'll be really interesting look forward to that and uh if you haven't already subscribed to us on your favorite podcasting platform do so we're on spotify youtube apple all those different things uh uh, and like i said i'm sorry uh google uh but we're also on youtube for the video form content so we do overlay video uh links all that kind of stuff and uh if you would uh visit our website every once in a while we got new content we publish news things like that as well as product reviews so uh join us uh subscribe to us and uh, until the next one peace